Positive Poetry, and you might be wondering what qualifies a 12-year-old to teach about this. Well, my name is Adora Skeetalk, and at the age of seven, I published my first book called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. And more recently, I published a second book called Dancing Fingers, which is a book of poetry that I co-authored with my older sister, Adriana. And Dancing Fingers is a book which contains quite a bit of reflective poetry, actually, that there's an entire section on it. Now, reflective poetry to me is quite an interesting topic because it covers quite a bit. Anytime you've ever reflected on something and thought, I'm mad about this, this is kind of stupid, and written a poem, that would be reflective poetry. So what is something you've reflected on this weekend or this week? <laughs> You're telling me you haven't thought about anything this entire week? Thank you. 
Yeah, you need imagination to make up those ideas, to figure things very good. So, uh, if you feel strongly about this quote, that may be a good one. Let's take another quote. Um, this is from Plato. It is a common saying, and in everybody's mouth, that life is but a soldier. So what do you think this quote means? Anybody could just chime in whenever. What does soldier mean? A soldier is a journey that one takes. So basically, if you want to get really basic, it is a common saying in everybody's mouth that life is but a soldier. So people are saying life's a journey. That would basically be what that quote means. What do you think about that? That you never know where life is going to take you. Yeah, you never know where life is going to take you. Very good. Uh, William Shakespeare said there are, oh, and I believe this is from a play. There are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your <laughs> philosophy. What does that mean? That's from Hamlet. Hamlet, okay. All there is to know. Then, okay, so there are more things in heaven and earth than you know about, perhaps, than you can dream of, really. An interesting quote. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, I think that somehow we learn who we really are and then live with that decision. So that's pretty straightforward. And then Confucius said, I want you to be everything that's you deep at the center of your being. So here are some quotes. And how do you think we could perhaps think of a poem from one of these? By talking about how it applies to your own life. You could talk about how it applies to your life. Very good. What else? By expanding upon what the quote says. I'm sorry? By expanding upon what the quote says. By expanding upon what the quote says, maybe developing your own thoughts about it and sharing your own idea about what it means. Very good. And what is another way we could develop a poem from one of these? restate it throughout the poem and make that uh, be an important part of it, or have it not maybe state it directly, but have it as sort of the theme. Um, so let's choose one of these to look at and write a poem from. Which one do you think we should use? First one. First one. First one. First one. Okay, I hear a lot of first ones. So it looks like Albert Einstein wins here. So imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. How could we reflect on that? Thinking about what, come, what could come in the future by what we think. Very good, yeah. We could think about what comes in the future by what we think. So. Use your imaginations. Where do you think the future will take us? Let's write down a few ideas. To Mars. To Mars? <laughs> okay. Out into space. And to... So out into space. What else? Where else can our imagination take us? Center of the Earth. Has anyone read that book by Jules Verne about going into the center of the Earth? And I think they.
I saw the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So the movie, yeah, that's the easy way out. Um, yeah, so our imagination can take us to places where our knowledge hasn't yet because scientists have figured out a way to drill down in the center of the Earth. Actually, it's probably good they haven't, but our imagination can take us there. So that's kind of a powerful thought. So we could, we could write pretty easily a quick poem about um, maybe contrasting the places knowledge has taken us with the places imagination can take us. So where are some of the places our knowledge has taken us? <laughs> With what we know, we've gone to the moon, we've explored the oceans. Do we want this to rhyme at all, by the way? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, is there anything that rhymes? We came out of the oceans and we discovered the anatomy of snow. Um, I guess, okay, sure. Fine, why not? We discovered the anatomy of snow. Sorry. With what we know, we've gone to the moon, we've discovered the anatomy of snow. Uh, we can... Oh, go ahead, sorry. What rhymes with the Monsoon, soon, noon. Baboon. Baboon. Coon. Coon. Raccoon, yeah. Doom. Um. Placed many a coon. Alright, this is supposed to be a reflective poem, not a ridiculous poem. Oh, oh. Yeah, the woman of 
humanity's birth or something like that. Okay, that sounds great. So here's our problem so far. With what we know, we've discovered the anatomy of snow. We've gone to the moon by explorers whose lives have ended too soon. But with what we dream, we've seen unseen, traveled to the center of the earth, the womb of humanity's birth. Okay? So that's fairly good. Should we write another stanza, or do you think it's good as it is? Yeah, let's do another one. So there was another stanza. Did you see? Yeah. Yeah. So we so far we contrast what we know and what we dream. We could write another one about what we know and what we dream. We could write another two stanzas if you wanted. Yes. Okay, let's do that. Yep. With something what we know, let's think of something else that rhymes with no that is not snow. What's wrong with snow? <laughs> because we Bro. already used Bro. it. Bro. Bro. Oh, we discovered how to make cats glow. <laughs> yeah, we have discovered how to make cats glow. Did you guys see that picture? But, um. <laughs> what is all this? Something like. Make historians be Something like that. Well, we could do something about growing. So, with what we. Maybe we renounce. Show. Hey, do you know how to rhyme? Let's see. There's. Do you want to rhyme? Yeah, we, we want to rhyme. But since we've rhymed everything else, I mean, we could change for something. But. So, here's. This is an option. With what we know, we've made crops grow, but that seems, I mean, a little bit odd. Um, let's see, we... Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that in for, the, for now. With what we know, we've made crops grow and cats glow. Um, <laughs> so, what else have we done with what we know? It doesn't have to rhyme, no. Traveled around the world. Traveled around the world. Written history books. So what rhymes with world? Swirl. Swirl. of 
That's close enough. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a close rhyme. That's that's kind of a slant rhyme. It's like cheating in rhyming. But Emily Dickinson did it a lot, so that's my excuse. All right, so let's read our poem now. With what we know, we've discovered the anatomy of snow. We've gone to the moon by explorers whose lives have ended too soon. But with what we dream, we've seen unseen. Traveled to the center of the earth, the womb of humanity's birth. With what we know, we've made crops grow, traveled around the world, ancient mysteries unfurled. But with what we dream, we found that things aren't always what they seem. We're free of boundaries, allowed to create realities. Okay, great. So. Yeah, what else are you Singing. 
And if you want, you can also, I'm sure some of you have heard these as well. But um, the first one we're going to be looking at, uh, the times they are changing. So uh, I'm going to be reading it out loud. Obviously without the music. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changing. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide if the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon for the wheel's still in spin and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win for the times they are a-changing. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't walk up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who is stalled. There's a battle outside and it is raging. It'll soon shake your windows and ra rattle your, your walls. For the times they are changing. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand, for the times they are a-changing. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast. The slow one now will later be fast. As the present now will later be past, the order is rapidly fading. And the first one now will later be last, for the times they are a-changing. So, does anyone know what this poem, what, what does this mean to you? When you hear this poem, or this song, uh, what do you think it means? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty, uh, the nice, the lovely thing about Bob Dylan's songs is that you can learn a lot by looking at the title. So, the times they are changing. So, changing times. Now, uh, take a look at this first stanza. Let's go through it kind of line by line. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown. What do you think that means? Rivers are growing wider. All the older people have to realize that the younger people have new ideas and theories. Yes. Yeah, that's a very valid point. If, if you look at actually some of the other songs, let's see, I think the the um, this one in particular, the one come mothers and fathers of the land, and don't criticize what you can't understand. So this one's in very times actually, because your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. What it's saying here is kind of about young people rising up, going beyond their parents' command. Uh, and, and so that stanza definitely speaks to what you're talking about. So heading back to the first stanza, um, about the waters are growing, using that metaphor, what do you think that could be representing? How the world is in trouble. It could be about world being in trouble. It could also be, um, if you look at the thing about accept it soon, you'll be drenched to the bone, uh, and then you better start swimming or, you're sp or you'll sink like a stone. So it's kind of saying you have to swim or you yeah, have to tough. maybe adapt yeah. in order to survive. That could be possibly what it's saying. Um, so yeah, the times they are changing, and it's... I guess sort of a call to the people that you need to change along with that. You need to swim or else you'll sink. What else do you think this poem could be talking about?
actually, it's interesting if you look at this one. So, the first song seems to be addressing everyone. Come gather around people, wherever you roam. Then this one is come writers and critics, senators, congressmen, mothers, and fathers. So it's addressing all these sections of the population. What do you think all these sections of the population might have in common? They influence other people. <coughs> They're decision makers. They're decision makers? Yeah. What else? They have power. They have power. They have power. They're they have decision makers. They yes. Power over you. They have power over you. They have power. They're decision makers. Um, and then if you look at the last stanza, uh, the slow one now will later be fast as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading. So these people are the people who are in power, who are the decision makers now. In this stanza, in the last one, it's saying about how the order is rapidly fading. The people who are first will be last. Um, and so it could be kind of a warning to those sections of the population. You know, you need to change, you need to swim, or else you'll sink. And uh, yeah, so it's really very interesting to look at. Um, any last thoughts about this? Go about the yeah. statement. I'm sorry? I said you can't be stagnant. Yes, you can't be stagnant, exactly. And you guys, that's a really good point. You can't be stagnant. You can't be just standing and unchanging. You really have to change all the time. So, very good uh, yeah. interpretation. Alrighty, now here's another one. Um, and this one's kind of interesting. It's in a different style. And this one is more of a narrative poem. So, does anyone know what a narrative poem is? One that narrates. Yeah, it's one that narrates. It tells, it tells a story. Yeah, it tells a story. So a narrative poem uh, would be one that tells a story. It might be about a character um, or a person. So this one's called Ballad of Donald White. And I found it really interesting. So uh, I'll be reading that out. My name is Donald White, you see. I stand before you all. I was judged by you a murderer, and the hangman's knot must fall. I will die upon the gallows pole when the moon is shining clear. And these are my final words that you will ever hear. I left my home in Kansas when I was very young. I landed in the old Northwest, Seattle, Washington. Although I had traveled many miles, I never made a friend, for I could never get along in life with people that I met. If I had some education to give me a decent start, I might have been a doctor or a master in the arts. But I used my hands for stealing when I was very young, and they locked me down in jailhouse cells. That's how my life begun. Oh, the inmates and the prisoners, I found they were my kind. And it was there inside the bars I found my peace of mind. But the jails, they were too crowded. Institutions overflowed. So they turned me loose to walk upon life's hurried, tangled road. And there's danger on the ocean, where the salt sea waves split high. And there's danger on the battlefield, where the shells and bullets fly. And there's danger in this open world, where men strive to be free. And for me, the greatest danger was in society. So I asked them to send me back to the institution home, but they said they were too crowded. For me, they had no room. I got down on my knees and begged, oh, please put me away. But they would not listen to my plea, or nothing I would say. And so it was on Christmas Eve in the year of 59. It was on that night I killed a man I did not try to hide. The jury found me guilty, and I won't disagree, for I knew that it would happen if I wasn't put away. And I'm glad I've had no parents to care for me or cry, for now they will never know the horrible death I die. And I'm also glad I've had no friends to see me in disgrace, for they'll never see that hangman's hood wrap around my face. Farewell unto the old north woods of which I used to roam. Farewell unto the crowded bars of which have been my home. Farewell to all you people who think the worst of me. I guess you'll feel much better when I'm on that hanging tree. But there's just one question before they kill me dead. I'm wondering just how much to you I really said. Concerning all the boys that come down a road like me, are they enemies or victims of your society? So that is the Ballad of Donald White. Uh, and so what do you think this poem, uh, is, what is the message of this poem? Where do you find it? So all people are given the 
necessary chance that everybody can be great, but he wasn't, so he was subject to our society. Yeah, exactly. You said it wasn't really yeah. It could be kind of it a wasn't misery. It was fault that he killed him. Um, and, and there's also a lot of, um, so yeah, if you see kind of missed opportunities. If I had some education, give me a decent start, I might have been a doctor or a master in the arts. So missed opportunity. Uh, no education, and then um, if so, it's it's kind of going. Uh, so he's starting out in the present. He's about to be executed, and he goes back and he tells the story of his life. And um, so he said he was in jail, but then they had to re release him because there wasn't enough room. But he wanted to stay because he knew that he would uh, be in danger if he went back out. He says. Um, and he was using the contrast. So there's danger in the ocean where the salt sea waves split high. There's danger on the battlefield where the shells and bullets fly. There's danger in this open world where men strive to be free. And for me, the greatest danger was in society. So a lot of it is talking about how, for him, kind of the battlefield, the uh, danger, the area of danger was society. And um, also, I guess, a little bit of irony, maybe. He says he's glad that he had no parents, no friends, and it makes you think maybe if he had had parents or friends, would he have been in that position? It's kind of interesting. And then the last line, concerning all the boys that come down the road like me, are they enemies or victims of your society? So again, asking a question, and it's not a question that's uh, so much answered as is asked to the reader, kind of to make you think. And so, um, when you read a poem or hear a song that asks you questions, they're often tended to make you think and really uh, feel. So, um, and then here is one of Bob Dylan's most famous songs, probably Blowing in the Wind. So, raise your hand if you've heard this song before. I see a lot of raised hands. My dad is a big Bob Dylan fan, um, actually, so, and, and also a bunch of other uh, similar to its music, so I've heard this one before. So, um, this one is, let's see, okay, yeah, so I'll be reading this one. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? Yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, and how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times can a man turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Oh, okay, so, uh, what do you think this poem is talking about? Answer problems. Answer problems. So, do you think that this answers all these questions? No, not at all. It gives us kind of this elusive answer. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Now, when he says the answer is blowing in the wind, does that mean it's easy to get, hard to get? What, what do you think of the blowing in the wind? It's just hard to catch. It might be hard to catch. It might be elusive. Um, yeah, that's a very good thought. And, and honestly, this answer, the answer is blowing in the wind, that's kind of an elusive answer. And if it's blowing in the wind, you know, Maybe you could reach out to catch it, but you might not. It, it's an interesting thing to think about. What does he mean by blowing in the wind? Is it coming toward you? Is it? And there's all kinds of analysis you can get into with that one line. Um, and then also, so you see lines like, how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? Uh, and so what do you think that would refer to? War. War, yeah. So his view work. He's saying, how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? How many times do we have to get into conflicts? Uh, you know, war. So that definitely would be a common war. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of these questions that there aren't very many answers.
answers to. How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? And um, these are big questions about society, about conflict, about war, and then the answer is blowing in the wind of kind of that elusive answer. So yeah, it's an um, interesting one to think about. I words. think you have to also look at the, at the time in which the song was written um, in the early 60s when, I mean, when there was war, when there was racial injustice. And I think Dylan is saying that there are aren't any real answers to these questions, but they still need to be asked. Yes. <clears throat> Definitely. Very good point. Yeah, so, um, and, and think about, like, this was around the Vietnam War, this was around a time of lots of segregation. Definitely uh, the cultural surroundings of a song. And when you think about songs, then you need to think, when were they written? And so, for instance, a song written in the 1960s, which a, which a lot of our great songs were, then, and if they're talking about war, and if they're talking about injustice, then you know because of the social context of that. But the great thing about um, songs like this, even if this was written today, it would still be meaningful because these questions are questions that still need to be asked. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, saying that. Yeah, and, and so a lot of people say, you know, this is old music, I don't want to hear this, but the thing is, it's still meaningful and it's still important to listen to it and develop thoughts from it. And then finally, I think this is the last one, a hard rains are going to fall. Oh, where have you been, my blue-eyed son? Oh, where have you been, my darling young one? I've stumbled on the side of twelve misty mountains. I've walked and I've crawled on six crooked highways. I've stepped in the middle of seven sad forests. I've been out in front of a dozen dead oceans. I've been ten thousand miles in the mouth of a graveyard, and it's a hard, and it's a hard, it's a hard, and it's a hard, and it's a hard rains are gonna fall. Oh, what did you see, my blue-eyed son? Oh, what did you see, my darling young one? I saw a newborn baby with wild wolves all around it. I saw a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. I saw a black branch with blood that kept dripping. I saw a room full of men with their hammers of bleeding. I saw a white ladder all covered with water. I saw 10,000 talkers whose tongues were all broken. I saw guns and sharp swords in the hands of young children. And it's a hard, and it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, and it's a hard rain. And what did you hear, my blue-eyed son? And what did you hear, my darling young one? I heard the sound of a thunder, it roared out a warning. Heard the roar of a wave that could drown the whole world. Heard 1,000 drummers whose hands were ablaze. Heard 10,000 whispering and nobody listening. Heard one person starve, I heard many people laughing. Heard the song of a poet who died in the gutter. Heard the sound of a clown who cried in the alley. And it's a hard, and it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, and it's a hard rain. Oh, who did you meet, my blue-eyed son? Who did you meet, my darling young one? I met a young child beside a dead pony. I met a white man who walked a dog. I met a young woman whose body was burning. I met a young girl. She gave me a rainbow. I met one man who was wounded in love. I met another man who was wounded in hatred. And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain. It's going to fall. Ah, sorry. Oh, what will you do now, my blue-eyed son? Oh, what will you do now, my darling young one? I'm a going back out for the rain starts to fall and I'll walk to the depths of the deepest black forest where the people are many and their hands are all empty where the pellets of poison are flooding their waters where the home in the valley meets the damp dirty prison where the executioner's face is always well hidden where hunger is ugly where souls are forgotten where black is the color where none is the number and I'll tell it and think it and speak it and breathe it and reflect it from the mountain so all souls can see it then I'll stand on the ocean until I start sinking but I'll know my song well before I start singing. And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain to kind of fall. Okay, so, um, a big theme in this poem seems to be death. If you look at, um, you know, there's a dead ocean, dead pony, um, oh, there's a lot of that in there. What else do you think is a big theme here? There's sometimes things of good things. I'm sorry? There are hints of good things. Hints of good things. Yeah, uh, there are hints of good things. Rainbow. Yeah, there's a rainbow. I met a young girl who gave me a rainbow. Very good. So what do you think that rainbow might represent? Any ideas about that? Hope. The future can be hard, but you have to have hope. Well, it's also symbolic of the great flood. The rainbow follows that. And then um, a hard 
rains are going to fall, there's a lot of things that could refer to. Um, and definitely this, um, uh, let's see, um, I heard the sound of a thunder, it roared out a warning, heard the roar of a wave that could drown the whole world. So this rain that's going to fall, um, that could possibly, well, if, if you've heard like Noah's Ark, it could possibly be kind of a uh, similar reference to that. Um, and then just that kind of, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I don't think anybody said anything. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's it. Okay, uh, what are some other things? No, 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 I didn't touch it. Oh, okay, uh, no. He's probably, but using it, I think he's using it as a metaphor for the, uh, for the trouble that people are going to be getting into eventually if they don't Look at, look around, and see what what's going on. Definitely, and and you see a lot of that talking about this kind of stark uh, road ahead, almost. Yeah, if if, and I think that a lot of if you look at his lyrics, are talking about you know people. You need to wake up. You need to see this, and that's a really important theme. Well, thanks for uh, saying that. Alrighty. So um, overall, what are what are your thoughts about Bob Dylan's songs? Very meaningful, yes, definitely. And you read a lot of songs, you'll see a lot of meaning, uh, a lot of talking about society and war and time and, and all these really big thoughts. And they definitely give you thinking. When you read these, you think about these important topics. Um, and obviously, I, I chose um, um, some that were, you know, uh, very poetic, and, uh, which most of his are and, and had really big meanings. But then there are a lot of songs that are a little lighter and um, and and. Let's see, one of my favorites is, I think it's Subterranean Homesick Blues, yeah, something. Homesick blues. Oh yeah, that's it. I love that one, especially the last stanza. Now, if you guys want tips on how to rhyme, read that that one. That is an amazing <laughs> um, Okay. Some, some people consider Bob Dylan to be the first rap artist because of that song. Oh, I know, because I was reading that, and I was like to my dad, this is an amazing song. And I read the last one, and I was like, man, that could be rap. And he's like, yeah, it is pretty much rap. <laughs> All right, so um, now that you've seen some Bob Dylan songs, you can you know that you really can reflect on a lot of things. You can reflect on big things like war and society. You can reflect on small things. Uh, you could write poetic responses to natural disasters, car crashes, scientific discoveries, local news stories, weird news stories, riots, or even celebrities if you really want to be uh, that shallow. <laughs> well, uh, you can reflect on pretty much everything that goes on in your world if you use poems as kind of that mirror to share your ideas, to share your reflections, what you think about what's going on, then you can really come up with some very meaningful poems. Alrighty, so are there any questions that I can answer now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just ask, and it doesn't matter, the sequence doesn't matter. Do you have a favorite place to go to write? If no. so, where? Do I have a favorite place to go to to write? If so, where? Um, that's a good question. Usually I would write um, I wouldn't say I have a favorite place. I write a lot in our house's office or in the living room. I guess I kind of alternate between those two places. Interesting. When did you write your first poem? When did I write my first poem? Uh, when I was about, let's see, I, I mean, I I guess I wrote a poem when I was five. It wasn't a very good poem. It was kind of a collaboration with my sister. And then, uh-oh. 